can you handle a short exhortation? Just a short exhortation. Then got just a powerful time at the end that we're gonna uh, we're gonna hear somebody share something and we're gonna pray. But we're in a series, and this isn't gonna be long. But we're in a series called Words. What are we really saying? Uh, Pastor Brandon kicked it off a few weeks ago with the word word. And only Pastor Brandon could take the word word and make a great message out of it. And Pastor Ryan talked last week about salvation. Incredible. I head to Pakistan in three weeks. I told him, I need that message. I need that message. That message is going to be preached in Pakistan. So he sent me that message. And then I talked about communion. And you know, the thing with words, I mean, words are very powerful. Would you agree with that? I mean, they, they, they build up and they tear down. They shape, they conform, they mold, they deform. You know, think about, think about, you know, how powerful the word cancer is. You know, if you've ever known anybody that had cancer and they hear that word, the first time they hear that word, most people will say, from, from the time that word is spoken to them, everything else just becomes a blur and they don't hear anything else. <coughs> but think about the words... I'm giving you a raise. Think about what those words do. Or think about the word pregnant. I'm pregnant. Depending on what your situation is, that's a great word. Right? I mean, words, I mean, they shape, they form, they're powerful. You know, they can be overused and underdefined. Would you agree with that? And a lot of times in the body of Christ, we throw words around out there. Even words like love, I love you, you know. Salvation, like Ryan talked about last week, who's great exegete. Um, all these words can just get under underdeveloped, underdefined, lose their kind of weightiness. And so a lot of times we say words that we think everybody really understands. And so just think it's really important just for a few minutes to talk about this word. Um, once again, I don't know why this word, because I had another message completely almost done. And I and then God said, that's not the message. And then I, I got halfway through another message, and it was like, that's not the message. I was like, why don't, why don't you tell me that at the beginning? And, and, you know, and he said, go through all this and scrap those two. And he goes, no, the word is fellowship. Everybody say the word fellowship. I don't see you hear that word. It's a churchy word. You know, where do you fellowship? Or we call all social gatherings, you know, knitting circles or little potlucks, you know, fellowship. And so, you know, we kind of throw that word around. I'm thinking, that's such a simple, overused word. Why would you want me to just even talk on, on the word fellowship. But then I thought about the Apostle Paul. He said, I'm going to stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. So creative redundancy is a good thing. Repetition is a good thing. And that's how we learn and that's how we grow. And so let's just take a few minutes here and talk about this word fellowship. It literally means the common life, a common life together. Now, you know the power of words. Proverbs 18.21 says this. Life and death are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Would you agree words have power? <laughs> yeah, you would agree. That's a given. Proverbs 12, verse 18. There is one who speaks rashly, like the thrusts of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Let me ask you, how many of you ever have been cut by somebody else's words? How many of you have ever cut somebody else by your words? That's called fellowship. <laughs> we all have that in common, don't we? We've all been the victim of words. We've all victimized people with words. I just want to share this, this, this little story about this kid named Rickson. He's a 10-year-old kid in Malaysia. And a few months ago, Robbie and I were there, and we did some great ministry with some missionary friends of mine there. And on the way from the airport, they told me about this kid they have in their apartment complex. It's Rickson. And they said, man, he's, he's, boy, he's a terror. You know, he's, he's taken baseball bats and he's gone after older kids and like whacked them in the legs and sent them to the hospital. There's that sick part of me that goes, I want to meet that kid. <laughs> so maybe, maybe they were bullied and kind of deserved it. I don't know, you know. So they just tell me, so, you know, when somebody, you know, shares words about somebody, you know, it evokes imagery and, and you start thinking about, you know, what this person's going to be like. So I, I, I picture this, you know, just tough, bad-looking kid. And so we get to the apartment, and this kid comes wandering up, and he's like this really sweet kid, and my heart just had this instant connection with him. 
I don't know what it was. It was just an incredible favor. And so it was like a Tuesday night, and uh, they wanted me to teach a Bible study at their apartment. And they, you know, had 20 to 25 people there. It was very crowded. There was a lot of food. I mean, it was just a great time. And there was, there was uh, ethnic Malay people there. There was Muslims. There was non-Christians. There was Christians. There was missionaries there. I mean, it was a potpourri of people. And it was really a great atmosphere. And so I taught, and we prayed, and we worshipped, and it was great. And we were eating. And somebody mentioned his name. They mentioned Rickson's name. And I just said, just out of the blue, I said, Rickson. I said, I love that kid. I said it just like that. That's it. And then, you know, it was just hubbub and people talking and moving on. Didn't think much about it. He was there at that meeting. And so the next day, my friend's wife comes up to me and, and says, do you know what you did last night? And I went, oh, no. You know, I, I mean, I've been known to say a few stupid things, you know. Um, so I mean, I'm thinking, what did I say? Who did I who did I offend? And you know, the Rolodex was spinning. You know, I was panicked. She goes, "You remember last night when when somebody asked you about Rickson and you said, Rickson, I love that kid." I said, "Yeah." She said he was in the kitchen and he heard you, and he broke down and started bawling. I said, "Really?" He said, "Yeah." I thought, isn't that powerful? I want you to hear this now. Five words. That's it. Five words. Rickson, I love that kid. Now this is going to sound weird. You may think it's arrogant. I'm just going to tell you in my spirit what I firmly believe. I believe those five words said in the way that they were said have changed the trajectory of that kid's life. I believe that. Now what do you think? That's, that's humbling. I'm telling you. So they send me updates. They message me, you know, and they said, he asks about you every single day. They show that picture. We had this picture taken. They sh he shows that picture to everybody that comes over to our house. Five words. I believe if any of you would have said those five words to him, the way that I said it, I believe it would have had the same effect. So don't, don't underestimate the value of your words. They're powerful. Now, I just wanted to share, wow, one verse. Can you handle one verse? First John chapter 1, verse 1. This word fellowship. Now, real quick, you've got the Apostle John, who's 85 to 90 years old. He's an old dude. And he's going to write, you know, he wrote John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, John. 1st John is, you know, really great because he, you know, repetitiously uses the same words. He talks about light and darkness. He talks about life and death. He talks about fellowship. He talks about assurance. Uh, and he just keeps weaving these in and through. And how many of you know that older people don't waste a lot of words? Older people, that would be people that are older than 62. Okay, that's an older person. A person that's older than 62, uh, when you hear them talk, they don't, they, they don't just talk about nothing. They're, they're not a new sports and weather type people. They speak from years of reflection, years of depth, years of substance. And so the Apostle John is speaking from that vein. And who he's addressing, 1 John is really a, 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 an apologetic letter to the church in regards to the Gnostic heresy. How many of you have heard of Gnosticism? Don't have time to get into it, you know, but basically they, they believed that Jesus was a phantom or an apparition, um, that he wasn't really material, he wasn't natural, he wasn't in the flesh, because they despised the flesh, they despised materialism. Um, you know, they believed that was evil. They believed in two creators. One was a good creator, one was a bad creator. Jesus simply was a cosmic consciousness that kind of came and helped us transition out of the flesh because it was bad. So, you know, he wasn't the Messiah. Jesus wasn't the Messiah. He wasn't the Son of God. He wasn't incarnational. And when Jesus walked, he didn't leave footprints. That's what they believed. And so the Apostle John is going to come and he's going to confront their thinking. Um, and let me just say this, that Gnosticism, that there wasn't a church of Gnostics. You know, it was just a school of thought. It was just a philosophy of some of the people back then. So it wasn't like this big organized thing. But in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, here's what John says. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we, everybody say the word we. We, we have heard and we have seen 
with our eyes, and we have looked upon him, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. What John is saying there is, I participated in his life, and he's still alive, and I want you to participate in the life of Christ like I participate in the life of Christ. What he's saying is, our faith is experiential. It's not just doctrinal. It's just not things to learn. It's just not ritualistic. No, it's participatory. And that's what John's after right here. In fact, if you just read the next like three verses on your own, you will see ten times he uses the words, we and us and our. He never talks about just me, my. He never just talks you know, about himself. He's talking about the plurality. Christianity, our faith, is plural, not singular. And so that's what he's talking about right here. Now let me ask you a question. How many of you believe that Jesus spoke back then? How many of you say, would say he still speaks today? How many would say you have heard his voice? And let me, let me just say this. Make no mistake that this is the word of life right here. This is the word of truth. This is the very word of God speaking, spoken, and will speak to us right now. Anytime if you're somebody that says... I just don't hear God. I just don't think God speaks. I really want to encourage you. Pick up this book. And on every page, cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation, including in some bizarre way the genealogies, <laughs> God is speaking to you. He is speaking to you. And, 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 you know, there's a lot of times, if you wonder why, how many of you would say in the last, hmm, Three months, there have been seasons where it's been very hard for you to pick up the Word of God. Would you? Okay. I'm just going to tell you what that is. That's a demonic attack against you. The enemy knows these words are life and they're light. And they bring freedom and they bring hope and they bring deliverance. And the last thing the enemy wants you to do is get into this book. That, that's, that's it right there. So you got to get into this Word. Now, I love it when what you talk about has real-time connection to it. So I just said, Jesus spoke. Jesus still speaks, and he's going to speak tomorrow. Rather you listen, rather I listen or not, he's still speaking. So I went to, I went to elementary school, middle school, and high school with a girl that lived five houses down. And she was an atheist. I didn't know it. And she was the new kid in the school. And she was my first girlfriend. <laughs> so you, now you're wondering, well, how did you land her? Well, here's how I landed her. She was the new kid sit, sitting outside of the office at the elementary school, and she had fishnet nylons on. And they were green. And I walked by, and I said, fishnets, yuck. And I kept walking. <laughs> So here's a scared new girl who is absolutely petrified with some mean boy, and that's how I got to her to be my girlfriend. So, so, after high school, lost track of her for many, many, many years. I saw her comment on a mutual friend's Facebook, and the mutual friend is a worship leader in Los Angeles, and as a nonprofit, and has been to, hate, uh, been to Jamaica over 50 times to work with the poor. And so I happened to see the, the comment, and so, I reach out to her and I and I connect. We reconnect, and I find out that she's a Christian now, which you know I scratch my head, but she scratched her head too when she heard about me. <laughs> and so she sends our mutual friend kind of her testimony, and she sent it to me. And I just want to read you a paragraph and just tell you how powerful the voice of Jesus is. She's referencing our mutual friend, and she said, I never knew what you were doing or how you did it all with your charity. I'm getting mature enough now to know it was just your pure God-given faith you've always had and showed me in some streak of sunlight in the ninth grade as you looked up passages in the Bible to guide you that day. Now, we're not talking Christian schools here. We're talking public schools. But my friend watched our other friend looking through scriptures at school. 
That I could not understand as a sophisticated, well-trained atheist. I am so grateful that that morning when God came to me and just said in my heart, I am. You are mine. My heart, my hands, my eyes to bring me into this world for my love and will. How'd she get saved? How'd she become a believer? God spoke directly to her. And when the I am says I am, you better listen. <laughs> and her life has been radically changed. She's been in Mexico for 20 years. Goes to a solid church. I looked it up. Let me tell you something. God is still speaking. Once again, you got to hear that it's intentional. He's speaking. We're intentional about listening. We're intentional about paying attention. And once again, you just... Just connect this to Acts chapter 2, the early church. You, you, you know these verses. We talked about, Pastor Ryan, I believe, talked about community about three months ago. But this early church that was birthed, listen, listen to what it says. They devoted themselves. They were, you know, they were diligent. They were constant. It, it literally means they were devoted to the point that they wouldn't faint. Okay, so they were, I mean, they were doggedly pursuing themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. I mean, this was a natural thing. They didn't have to sign people up. They didn't have to have fancy PowerPoints. You know, they didn't have to, to, to give things away so that people would participate. The reason is, I believe, is because they were baptized into fellowship in the upper room, Acts chapter 1, 120 people for 10 days straight. And if you're in the same room with, 10, with 120 people for 10 days, you will either love them or hate them. And they loved each other, and they loved God, and they prayed. And they were in one accord, and the Holy Spirit came. And so, before they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they were baptized into fellowship with one another. That's a powerful thing. Yeah. Fellowship is experiential to the degree that we're intentional. New study. Published in the Journal of Social and Relationships. Recently calculated that on average it takes about 50 hours of time with someone before you consider them a casual friend. That's a lot of hours just to have a casual friend. 90 hours before you become real friends. And about 200 hours to become close friends. The tide, the pull in our culture is not pushing you to relationships. It's pulling you away from relationships. Yeah. It's hard. Is there anybody in here in the last 48 hours that hasn't said how busy they were? <laughs> I'm always amazed at those people because they're never too busy to tell you how busy they are. In fact, I always think, you know, the time you're using to tell me how busy you should probably be doing something. <laughs> Just the thought, that's free. So here's, here's, here's really my question here. Who do you have when you go through Challenge Valley? Who do you have alongside you when, not if, you go through Challenge Valley? You will go through challenges. Has there anybody here that has not gone through a challenge or a million? No, challenge. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. You will have tests and trials. My question is, who do you have to walk you through Challenge Valley? When there's the dark night of the soul. You know when the dark night of the soul is, right? Where you go from like high octane, believing, worshiping, to where is God? Why is this happening to me? How come I'm not hearing him? Why does it seem like every day is a perpetual wilderness experience? Why does my heart feel shrunken and shriveled? My question is, who do you have to walk with you? Because you will need people to walk. Listen, you go through the whole New Testament, Gospels, you don't see very few people live their walk with Christ by themselves. And I will tell you, if you think you're going to walk through this journey of life just by yourself, it's suicide. Because we're designed for that. We're designed for relationships. Now, I want to I have somebody come up right now that 
uh, has gone through Challenge Valley. And I want you to hear what he says about people and the sacrifice of others and how it helps sustain him. Would you welcome Dave Walshman as he comes up and share it. So many of you may know that I went through a challenge with cancer, journey with cancer. And when I first started recording this and kind of keeping a journal, I didn't realize I was journaling, I thought I was keeping notes. Um, I titled it The Journey. And I've learned some things along the way, and um, I want to share a couple of them with you. So it, was, it started in May of, of 2016. Um, a melanoma patch was found on my back. And it's one of those spots that's low enough that I really couldn't see it. And my wife said, hey, you better go get that checked. It's a dark spot back there. And I didn't think much of it because I'd been into the dermatologist from time to time to have you know, skin stuff done. And he looked at it and he says, yeah, it doesn't look very good. So let's go ahead and get it checked out. And so they did. They sent it into the lab and they came back and says, yeah, it's, it's melanoma. And it's deep enough beyond the skin depth that it has to be removed surgically. I can't do it here at the dermatologist level. He said, but we caught it early. You should be fine. Uh, we're going to get you set up for surgery. And so I went and met my surgeon. And he's a young guy. Great. To get, I get the young surgeon. So that, but that was reassuring because I knew, oh, can't be that serious if they're giving me the young guy. <laughs> this was good. This was good. And, and so he said, you ain't got it early. We, we should be fine. So they did all the things they needed to do to get me ready for surgery. and, and a few days later, I get the phone call and to come on in and chat with him about the findings. And he said, you know, we, we got it all. And so now there's a nice little seven inch reminder across my back. And uh, he said, but it has moved. We, we removed a couple of lymph nodes where they thought it might go if it had been moving. And they found melanoma cancer cells in my lymph system. And I don't know if you know much about the lymph system, but it goes through your entire body. And that's how when cancer gets, in my case, from the skin to inside, it can go anywhere. And melanoma, I learned, goes to the backbone, it'll just tear it up. It goes to your eyes, that brain, and it'll just keep moving until it's torn enough of your body up that you will get, you'll die. So I'm looking it up now. Now I get home and I'm Googling, right? So Google, right, is like your best friend and at the same time, your worst. So I run find these statistics that are just crazy. And I'm this optimistic, positive up guy and I'm now feeling like a ton of bricks has just hit me. So I reached out to a few friends and Kathy Gove sent me a scripture that she had been studying. It was from a devotion. Interesting how she was just going through it. And it was from 2 Samuel 22, and it's where David is praising God. He's looking back on his deliverance from Saul. And he's praising God for this deliverance. That he had protected him from his enemies, and that God is, was, and is victorious, and that we should give glory and take comfort in him. So I printed this out. All right? I've got this now by my bedside, because at the middle of the night, while I'm thinking all these positive things and saying, yeah, we're going to whip this thing during the day, at night, at the end of the bed, when everybody else was asleep and it's dark, I would swear to you that I saw the Grim Reaper pointing his little ugly, bony finger at me, saying, you, you're next. I don't care how strong you are, sooner or later, that's going to play with your head. And I'd get that 2 Samuel 22 out, and I would read it. But it wasn't me reading David talking about thanking God for his protection from Saul. It was me praising God. And I did that over and over. I had to reprint it. You know, okay, it got to the point where I couldn't read it anymore. And I was fairly active on, on Facebook, and so I started to share my journey digitally. And not only everybody here. And so in July of 2016, when I learned this, I posted my first prayer request for this journey that I was on. And 77 people responded. 
Now these aren't just people who casually, I mean they responded, they were active, actively praying for me. Over the next three months, in an effort to contain the cancer, two more surgeries were needed, it removed all of the lymph nodes in my right groin area, not fine, up down into the, into the lower, in my upper leg. And I'm gearing up now post-surgery for my first PET scan to see if they can find anything in me. This is a few months after the surgery. And I'm getting ready to write another post. You know, please pray, if, you know, going to have another, you know, another, another test. I want to get you know, positive results, obviously. And in the middle of writing this thing up, I very clearly hear God ask me, don't you trust me? And it's like, I'm not supposed to ask for prayer? Really? Now, I didn't quite get what he was saying. You know, the focus needed to be on God. So the test came out fine. The test came out great. They couldn't find anything. And I did post, after it was done, the celebration of, hey, I just went through this test. I wanted to let everybody know who's been praying along with me. And how many here? 184 people celebrated. 184. Yeah. Yeah. So now fast forward a year later. Sue, my wife, and I are in our, on our anniversary trip. And I wake up one morning, and I'm looking in the mirror. And I see five spots across my chest. And there's probably as many spots down my right leg. And now these aren't just little flat spots. These are like, they're not like freckles. These are arched up, black, nasty looking things. It's like, what the heck are those? Well, I knew what they were. Next morning, there was another 10 or so down my leg. By, by the time my leg was done, there were probably 20 or so of these small blisters, cancer tumors, migrating across my body. Oncologists said, now this is stage four, it's moving. And they took some checks to see where it was from, and they could tell it was all from the original site. It wasn't different. It was the same melanoma moving. So I'm back to Google again, because they said stage four. What's that mean? The American Cancer Society reports that melanoma is an aggressive and highly metastatic, meaning moving, highly metastatic disease. Metastatic mel melanoma is a fatal disease with a rapid systemic dissemination. The five-year survival rate is less than 15%. So here's this positive up guy, another ton of bricks. Melanoma does not respond to chemotherapy, I learned. And there are some immunotherapies that have been found that slow it down, but that's at best all it does. The oncologist said there were some recent studies, brand new at the time, that said, you know, if we combine two of these immunotherapies together, like a cocktail, let's put them both together in you, uh, they've been found to be more effective than just either one of them alone. And so I agreed to a six-month, 10-infusion regimen. 166 friends lifted me up in prayer. 166. So I was a week away from my third infusion. Had two of them down. Everything's going fine. About a week before the third one. Oh yeah, there's fun days. My thyroid and my liver failed because of the immunotherapy. Um, I was running 105 temperature, throwing up, freezing. I was shaking so bad. I remember shaking so bad that I couldn't have dialed 911 if I'd wanted to. It's like my whole body was just rejecting everything. And my Sue grabbed me, put me, pushed me into the car, rushed me to the emergency. So I was there for a couple of days as they restabilized my body. And I was down to 139 pounds at this point. This was probably the, the lowest. And it's interesting that I wasn't you know, what's going through my mind at this point is I'm not afraid of dying because I, I saw the writing on the wall. You know, I, I see what direction this is going. But what weighed on me was that I didn't want my family, my son, my daughters, my wife, 
to see their husband and their dad shriveling up and filled with tubes and painkillers. As that is just unbelievable sadness. That was the emotional. And that's where I was. So we pressed deep into healing prayer. Deep. My wife and children prayed over me. Hundreds of friends through Facebook. Every pastor and prayer team member prayed for me here. Sometimes I'd just walk up and I'd get near somebody being prayed for just so I could like pick it up, you know. <laughs> Osmosis. The youth that we'd seen grow up my daughters were part of it. You see them grow up and you pray that, that they're going to grow up and you know things are going to be good. To have them praying over you. My daughter leading in prayer over you. So we did that for a year. Praying, hoping, pleading. 2 Samuel 22. Over and over again. Fast forward a year. I go into my dermatologist and I say, hey, I've got, I've got these spots. They're still there. Now they've gone down by now. Some of them have turned gray. So I say, hey, can we have some of these? Can we get a couple of these checked? I'd really like to find out what's going on with them. And he said, sure. So we took a nasty kind of looking one off my collarbone, another one off of my right thigh. And we sent it in. He sent it into two different labs because he wanted to make sure of the outcome. Went to Kaiser and UC Davis. And he called me about a week later. I'll remember, I remember where I was driving on my way home when I'm listening to his message. And he said, the findings are consistent with complete regression of metastatic melanoma. Now, I know what I want that to mean, right? Complete regression of metastatic melanoma. Those are a lot of big words. It's kind of it's like, English, please. I'm calling my friends. I'm crying as I'm listening to it again. I'm, I'm calling my friends. Yeah, they're crying too. I get home. Where do I go? Google. <laughs> Got it. I find a report that says there's only 76 well documented, well documented, <laughs> well documented cases of complete regression of metastatic melanoma. 76. And complete regression of metastatic melanoma means they can't find any evidence that cancer was ever there. The only reason I know is the only reason they knew it was there was because of the medical reports, not because of what they found. So they find that there's only 76 well-documented cases. This is out of just looked this up a little bit ago, somebody asked from the first service. There's about 100, 137,000 cases of melanoma annually. There's only 77, I'm sorry, 76 known cases of well-documented complete regression. And so I'm thinking, God, 77? I have seven's a good number, right? right? <laughs> Two of them has to be really good. And so I'm making coffee one morning and I'm praying to God, what do I need to do? Not you. God, what do you, that's right, you're right, it's like, it's like, what do I need to do to be 77? What needs to happen? And as clear as I even heard just a moment ago, I hear God say, isn't what I've done enough? I make my coffee, and I back away, thank God, forget about 77 meal. Yeah. Fast forward to a month ago. If you were here, you heard Lana March talk about her miraculous healing of cancer. She had called Sue and I to go pray with her a couple of weeks before this, and we had. And she knew because of my journey, this was something that was going to be close to my heart. And we prayed over her. We prayed with her. We cried with her. We hoped with her. And two weeks later, she gets up and tells her story of the miraculous healing cancer gone and everybody here if you were here was celebrating remember that yeah. and i remember i'm celebrating with it and for a moment i reach out to god and i say ken can i hear from you that i'm healed i know how i feel can i just hear you say it i had a vision i'm walking in a path i'm following jesus he's in front of me and he looks over his left shoulder and he asks, 
what did you just ask me? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm thinking he's going to say, really, he didn't, but what did you just ask me? And I was like, all right, now I'm committed. I go, am I healed? Because he's, he's walking again. So he stops again, looks over his left shoulder, and he says, do you trust me? Well, of course I do. And he waves his hand. He smiles, and he waves his hand. He said, then just follow me. Now, I thought for a while that this was something that my brain kind of made up. I was thinking through it, you know, made this little story up. And what happened is when he waved, I saw something. Because when I think of Jesus, we all have our images of who, what Jesus might look like. And my image of Jesus would have been a pre-crucifixion Jesus that the disciples would have <coughs> spent time with. When he waved his hand, I saw the marks of the crucifixion. Wow. That was clearly a message from God saying, you're following the resurrected Christ. So what have I learned? We need to trust and keep our eyes on Jesus, not the storm. And there will be storms, valleys. We need to stay in community, fellowship. Remember all those people that reached out along the way? I cannot imagine going through this by myself. Couldn't have done it. And from these two, I need to be aware, we could be aware of opportunities to share the kingdom, to share Jesus' love, and to pray for others. I remember one time where friends stopped in the hallway at work prayed over and put hands on me in the hallway at work. They paused their life. They stopped their life for a moment in the craziness and the busyness that all of us experience. It's like we're going to share the love of Jesus right now and we're not going to move on until we're done. Because that commitment, while it may feel like a little prayer to you, it may make all the difference to them. shared pictures of the metastasized melanoma, and he said it was for my eyes only, and yeah, it was pretty intense. Um, you know, I think about the fact that there's a woman, Kathy Gove, who was in scriptures, who was prompted to take what she was reading that day, impart it to this man, who put it on paper by his bed, and it is in part what sustained him through Challenge Valley. So my challenge to you is, what word is God bringing you to, and beyond you, who is it for? So I'm going to pray for that, and, and I'm going to celebrate this man's life also. So Father, God, forgive us when, when we take life for granted. God, we celebrate life right now. So I celebrate Dave's life right here, God. I celebrate the journey, the battle. The fact that he prevailed and is prevailing. And I do pray, God, that you who began a good work in him will continue that work, developing, perfecting, and bringing to full completion the work you started in him. I pray that his testimony reaches a lot of people, brings a lot of hope and encouragement, God. And I pray for us. Lord, as we get into the Word this week, I pray that you would illuminate the scriptures that you would like us to share with other people beyond ourselves. So God, we celebrate. It's a day of celebration. We celebrate the risen Christ. We celebrate missionaries and missions and kids in other countries who received hope in life. And people that are battling cancer. God. We thank you that we have the victory in Jesus. So as we close, I would love for prayer team members to come forward. If you're somebody that has maybe been wrestling with cancer on some level or waiting for a biopsy, I would find Dave, and I would have Dave pray for you. So Father, bless these people as they go. I pray they have an awesome week in you. I pray that you would give them favor wherever they go. I pray that you would speak to us in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You're dismissed, church.